feels good to just let that truth in, that we are part of something greater. It's where we started our series, actually, with this idea of the allness of God. Now we're in principle number three, all about co-creation. We start out our Unity Basics class, typically, and we did this time online, with a play where it feels like Myrtle and Charles come back to life They're, because the acting is so good and they really embody um, the essence of what they are and who they were as they tell their story and also use their words. So in it, my friend Patricia Lansky plays Myrtle Fillmore and she speaks these words of Myrtle's. God is the one perfect life flowing through us. God is the one pure substance out of which our organism is formed. God is the only reality of us. When we, when we let the light flood us with its sunshine, all clouds vanish, and we begin to see ourselves in new ways that lead us to wholeness and health and unlimited spiritual growth. And after she says this, Charles is standing beside her, and they're looking out, it seems, beyond the audience, out into the horizon, and she says, Imagine if everyone knew that about themselves. And Charles says, imagine. And it is out of that pure imagination, that power of imagination and the heart's desire that our co-founders had, that they created the entire unity movement. Over a thousand ministries, including our very own, educational programs, pray. Uh, the, huge, the largest international prayer ministry in the world, um, publications, and the list goes on. All the ways that these ideas, these principles, these practices are, are given to the world so that we may take them up and make a better world, make a better life for ourselves in knowing the truth about who we are and how we can operate in this world at our best and highest good. So the Fillmores were creating out of their deepest heart's desire and their pure imaginations, right? And they then used the, the tools to align their thinking and their feelings and to keep aligned with what it is that they envisioned making happen in the world. And, and to share these principles with people that, you know, this, this allness of God, this God that is, is an ever-present love in the universe, and this idea that the divinity is also within us, that the power is also within us. And then this third principle, this power of co-creativity, that it is by our thoughts and feelings that we co-create our lives and our world. So our spiritual lineage is pretty solid, don't you think? <laughs> Let's take a look at that third principle so you can really take it in that we have a slide of that. And so it goes, we co-create our lives through the power of our thoughts and feelings. It'll be said in different ways. You'll see it written different ways. This is my version. But it's, it's basically this idea that, that we use these tools of our thoughts and feelings to align with the divine and to make the world and the life we want to live in. It's also known, this principle, as the law of mind action. Thoughts held in mind produce after their kind. And really popularly known as the law of attraction. So you understand probably or have been uh, exposed to those ideas that what it is that we hold in our minds and our hearts comes into manifestation in our world. So let's start co-creating. Let's start co-creating by looking at the first, those two essential components that, that Charles and Fillmore showed us in how to manifest desire and imagination. So desire in the old paradigm, in the old way of being, when God was only this thing outside of us or this man outside of us, and, and the church's dictates were the only rules to follow. Well, back then, desire was spoken of in hushed tones. That was considered a dirty word. But in the current paradigm, desire is the fuel. Desire is, is the, the thing that kind of kicks things off often. It's the desires that, that allow us, um, that give us sort of some of that juice for the co-creation process to happen. And so 
we learn, we evolve over time and recognize what it is that actually really works and feels true for us. And, and everything along the way, you know, in unity, our teachings are not um, something that we ask people to um, swallow whole <laughs> or to follow as a dogma or a doctrine. They're guidelines. They're the principles that, that have backing behind them in terms of tried and true experiences that leaders have had with them. And they've allowed us then to have this sort of shape or guideline to, to follow along the way. So that old way of thinking um, in the, what we desired was viewed as separate from God's will. So there was this idea that there's God's will and then there's human desire and never the two shall meet. But actually what we understand now is that God's will is just the divine bubbling up from within us from that place of the heart's desire. It's already there for us, and it's a part of the process, a key part of the process. And we're not, when we're talking about desire here, it's, it's probably important to say, we're not talking about, you know, the desire I have to eat a whole pint of ice cream right now. <laughs> that, that's not exactly the, what we mean. It's, it's what's underneath that, right? You could even use that as to say, well, what's the desire underneath that? So it's things like, you know, the desire for companionship, friendship, intimacy, connection, the desire for sweetness in our lives, the desire for love, the desire for, and, and there are other desires, right? A desire for purpose, a desire to make a difference, a desire to contribute. So all of those kinds of things are what we're really talking about when we're talking about heart's desire. Emily Cady was an early writer, Dr. Emily Cady, in the Unity Movement. In 1903, she wrote the Unity Classic Lessons in Truth. And in it, she describes this idea this way. She said, it's the approach of the thing itself striking you that makes you desire it or even think of it at all. <laughs> so it's, it's that, it's that two-way street, right? So the thing that I am wishing for, desiring, is also looking for me. And there's, a, there's something that just, the aha that strikes us, the idea that comes forth, the divine idea that falls into our hearts. That's the thing. That, and that's the place that it has come from, that the impetus to even think it or desire it at all. So the two are playing together. God's will is not something out there. It's a part of the process in us. Co-creating is also ignited then by the power of our imagination. Imagination is one of the 12 powers of humankind, also key teachings in unity. This idea is that the imagination sits at the third eye. It's that, that power that can be activated so that we can see from spirit's eye, we can see from the mind's eye and envision what it is that we wish to create. It's also the place through which a vision may come. So, you know, back in the day, we learned a lot about mystics who were having visions. People every day in our current lives have visions, right? And so it's through that power of imagination, through that third eye, that single eye that Jesus talked about, that we see in a different way. We cut through sort of the duality of the world and we call forth from the invisible realm that which we want to experience here on earth in the dual realm, in the relative realm. So um, imagination can also be more than just seeing. It can be feeling, it can be hearing, it can be sensing. Remember Joan of Arc. Joan of Arc was, was tried for all the visions and mystical experiences that she had. And the tribunal asked her, you say that God speaks to you, but that's just your imagination. And she said, how else would God speak to me besides through my imagination? So she was claiming it. Yeah, of course, imagination. That's the power. That's part of the fuel here that has allowed me to experience this essence of God, these visions of God. In the path of the holy fool, Lauren Artris, the local labyrinth expert that consulted on our, um, well, she's, she's locally situated, but she's, she's known worldwide as a, a, um, a leader in the uh, modern labyrinth movement, so this recent book that she wrote, The Path of the Holy Fool, is about the labyrinth and, and so much more. It's a lot about the power of imagination. She writes that when the West shifted from the 13-month uh, lunar calendar to the 12-month solar calendar, 
that the image of the zodiac that was removed was the spider. Now, the spider represents creativity. In the Hindu tradition, the spider represents the feminine. She spins the web out of her body. It, it becomes a place in which she feeds herself and births her young. And so she, she is that, that power, that divine feminine that creates from within and, and creates in the world, right? So she's really a symbol of creation, co-creation, our personal creativity, our artistry, all of those things. In Native American traditions, the spider is often referred to as grandmother spider, spider who is revered for her wisdom. So reclaiming our lost sense of creativity is, is a part of all this. I remember, you know, it's, you, you notice when these things get removed sort of culturally or religiously, it becomes then sort of the whole, the norm of the culture that it's not so important. I remember growing up, my oldest sister was really artistic and her dreams really were to be an artist. That's what she felt she was and what she wanted to do with her life. And I saw how those dreams faded away because she had no support for it, really. My dad would talk about how art was a hobby, not a career path. And the whole society really supported that same idea. And so those dreams just went to the cutting room floor, so to speak, and, I, and never really um, jumped in. But whatever it is that we are creating, it's not necessarily just what we would call artistry of painting and crafting and all the things that go under that umbrella, but it's also any, anything that we make is a creation, right? When we make a meal, when we create a garden, when we start a new project, when we write something, when we dance, all of that is creation. When we make a person, the ultimate creativity. So all of that is a part of this, this reclaiming that we, we, if we reclaim this power of co-creativity that we can do so much more effectively and, and so much more in a way that can benefit all of us. There's so much joy in the creative process and the products that get created out of it or the services or the energies that get created out of it. So it's time to reclaim our natural ability to create and start doing it. So how do we do that? Well, we can start with the longing, right? The, the, the desires of our hearts. What's sort of knocking on the door of, of your heart? What is it that you really would like to be doing in your life right now? Or it can be something really simple that you would just... I, I, I've been wanting, like recently I wanted to do soul collage. I'd never done soul collage and I found I loved it. So, but it wasn't until I just sat down and did it that I realized that that co-creative process that happens with the soul in that process that's different than vision boarding, which I didn't realize until I sat down and did it. Um, so it's that kind of thing, right? It can be something even small, a small activity like that that nurtures our creativity and that sparks something new through us and as us. And then it, we don't even know the ends of how that might play out in our lives, right? Because if we're using something different, uh, maybe the right side of our brain, th then that might show up in everyday life in a new way because we've expanded somehow. Co-creativity has no limits, really. It is very expansive in, it, in its possibilities. So what is it that you desire? Let's say that you desire a new part or to, to attract somebody into your life, a, a partner, a companion in your life. Or maybe it's that you want to deepen the current relationship that you have. Or maybe it's something for the world. Maybe, you know, you pay attention to, you have a sense of, I want to do something. I want to contribute, but I'm not sure what it is. You can ask yourself, what tugs on my heart? You know, what tugs at the heartstrings? That thing that, you know, oh, if, if the thing that I care about the most is the well-being of children, you know, the safety of our children or, or the well-being of animals or the well-being of the planet. Whatever it is that really is one of those things that really tugs at your heart, that, that helps see where to go with a co-creative process, how to get started. 
So we get the longing, we get that sense of the heart's desire, and then we can move to imagination, right? We can begin to activate that, that third eye, that place where, where the power of imagination sits and begin to image it, begin to vision it, begin to see that thing which you have desired. You kind of like kick it upstairs, right? And, and upstairs you begin to imagine through the mind's eye, what does it look like? And then, you know, there's an interplay going on. And then as you see that vision, when you close your eyes and you begin to see that vision and you see yourself in that scene, then you notice, how does it feel? How do I feel when I'm there? And so there's this this sense of going back and forth with the two. What do you see when you see those children that are well cared for, that are safe? What do you see? How does it look for the planet to be well cared for, the animals? Or for you to have that companion, that, you know, what does is, what is that person and that experience feel like and look like for you? How do, how do you, what joy does it bring? And specifically, what does it look like to be together? What do you do together? How do you spend your time? How does it feel? All of that is a part of this co-creative process. It's not linear because it's creativity, right? Creativity is everywhere. Creativity is a movement of energy. And so we get to move, it's like dance, right? We get to move with the way that the energy, the way that the music lifts us and moves us, the way that our bodies naturally want to go. And so co-creativity is like that. We're moving with the energy of spirit. We, we have that divine I- idea that comes up from up here that falls into the heart or we have the heart's desire that we bring upstairs to the imagination and we envision it and make it more real. Next week in the fourth principle, we'll talk more about the power of speaking it into being. We'll touch on that a little bit today. But through the power of affirmative prayer, we, we make it happen through the, the power of the word. But this is, this is the beginnings of that co-creativity stirring, Right? So the heart and the mind, desire and imagination, they toggle back and forth in this co-creative process. And of course, spirit moving all the way through and in between all those spaces and places within us. So the, f- the third thing to do, so we have the longing and, and the heart's desire idea, we have the imagination, and, and then we begin to focus, right? To begin to focus our thinking. This is where it really gets, you know, the work really happens, is in the focus. The, uh, so we begin to focus our thinking on what it is that we have desired and envisioned. And focusing on what we want can be especially challenging when what we don't want happens, right? For example a pandemic, an insurrection. When these things happen, it sort of throws us off and we get kind of, uh, you know, mired in those feelings and those thoughts of what we didn't want, of what we don't want to happen. And so our work then is to, to honor that, to honor those feelings, but then to sort of get back on the horse, right? And start aligning with the divine again. What do I want? What, in fact, sometimes when these things happen, they ignite our passions even more for us to be able to refocus and align once again with the divine. So the good news is that, and if we just stay with, with our thoughts lined up, it'll, be, it'll all be easy, right? <laughs> Maybe not easy, but simple, right? So the key and very plainly spoken here, key by Peter Boxa, who wrote the, the point of power says this, if thoughts equal energy and energy equals matter, then matter equals thoughts. Then thoughts become, sorry, instead of ad-libbing, I'm going to read what you're saying in front of the screen. If thoughts equal energy and energy equals matter, then thoughts become matter. Observe your thoughts. So that's the whole process, really, that, that we're working with energy and thought. It becomes matter. And so the key is to pay attention to what we're thinking, also what we're feeling. We'll get to that in a minute. When you notice your mind has wandered into lack and limitation, into the things that are not going to help you, you can simply shift and, and, and you can bring those thoughts back to the reason why you're doing it, Right? What was, oh yeah, what was that again? What was that desire I had? Oh, right, to keep the children safe. And so you see, you fall back into that and you go, oh yeah. And then you get that 
that energy once again stirring in you, that, that passion once again, and then you envision it again, and then you begin to think in that way once again. So it's just a, a slight shift sometimes that we can do to get back to what it is that we want to co-create. And again, it's not like we're constantly intending this. You know, I think about when um, I take people out on our nature immersions, we spend the whole, you know, a lot of times the whole morning setting our intentions. But then it's not like, you know, you should go about walking and sitting under the trees and whatever it is that you do that day, you know, focus on that. Oh, I got to remember my intention. I got to remember my intention. It's not so much like that. It's like we just then go about our lives, but we pay attention. We observe our thoughts, as Peter Boxa said, and notice really when they go astray. So how many of you, I wonder, <laughs> I wish I could see by a show of hands, um, know the book, The Little Engine That Could, a little childhood book. Oh, see, the hands are in the room. Excellent. <laughs> it was one of my very favorite ch uh, childhood books. And I see why now, because it is pure unity. So in the book, there's a train. It's filled with toys and food for the children. And it's, um, it's going to go over the mountain to deliver it. But the engine breaks down. And the toys get out of the train and start flagging down help because the engine has died and they need another engine to get them over the mountain so the children can play with them and they can have the good food delivered to them. And so the first train that they flag down is a, a brand new shiny engine, but that engine wants nothing to do with them. It's, you know, basically acts like it's too good for them and carries on. And the next engine is really big, but it too sort of kind of, you know, looks down its, its train-like nose and carries on and won't help. The third one is just plain too old and too tired and can't get over the mountain anymore. But the last one that comes is the little engine. And the little engine with a, a heart of desire to help really wants to help, but she is awfully little. And it doesn't really look like she can actually get up over that mountain, that she has that diesel power. But she goes ahead and says, I think I can. I think I can. I think I can. And she hitches to that train. And as she's chugging up the mountain, that's what she's chanting over and over again. I think I can. I think I can. I think I can. And she gets over the mountain. And once the toys and the food are delivered to the children, she says, I thought I could, I thought I could, I thought I could. And that story is really the essence of this principle. Knowing, thinking it into being. I can, we, we can, we, we will, we are. <laughs> it's happening. The little engine that could is you and me. And the thoughts fuel our ability to move in the positive direction, to climb up the mountain, to fulfill our heart's desires and deliver the goods, so to speak. Just as our mind and heart work together co-creatively co in this partnership, so too do our thoughts and feelings, the byproducts of, of our heart and mind, right? So there's this interplay between them as well. They're cl so closely woven that a lot of times it's too hard to tell, did I think that before I started feeling this way or did I start feeling this way and then think that story up or whatever it is that is reinforcing the feeling. So they just kind of intertwine with one another. It's sort of the chicken and the egg kind of <laughs> question. And so then finally, we've, we, so we've had these three, the longing, the imagination, by the way, this spells life, so it's an easy way to remember it. And, and then this last one is engaging our feelings, or you can remember it as emotions, but engaging our feelings throughout the process. So reconnecting with our heart's desire along the way will reignite those feelings, as I mentioned, and help us speak it into being. You could think of the feelings as the oil in the engine, a necessary part, right, to keep the engine running smoothly so it doesn't break down on the tracks. Something we aren't feeling some, uh, anymore um, because our desire sometimes has either already been fulfilled or we've just changed you know, sometimes that happens too. And so that's part of our feeling too. And maybe that's happened to you. Have you ever, you know, you dreamed of something and you, it finally came to fruition and you were like, eh, yeah, I don't think I really want that anymore. 
And so it's, if we stay attuned to what it is that we are feeling, we'll, we'll realize sooner that that's not the direction we're going anymore. So finally, let's just take a look at these quickly just so you can get a snapshot of, of these, not really steps, because again, it's not necessarily linear, but I have it laid out in a way that makes it, remem it, makes it easy to remember as the acronym LIFE. So the longing in your heart, what is that longing? The imagination, imagining it already fulfilled. The focus on thinking what it is that you want and then staying engaged with your feelings throughout the process. Harold Payne puts it all together beautifully in his song, very aptly named, Law of Attraction. Let's watch. Got my engine running With my own thoughts as fuel I'm making the decision to follow my vision as a divinely inspired tool. I'm going to wake up feeling good and grateful for the day. Cause it's up to myself to create happiness and wealth with what I think and say. And I'm living of attraction the no thoughts held in mind produce after their kind and give me ultimate satisfaction I know my heart is open and my focus is strong and things start to happen when my brain's taking actions to move it along we're all here for a reason, a divine purpose on earth. It's our gift to the world to let that purpose unfurl for all that we're worth. That's why we're living the law of attraction. Cause I know thoughts held in mind Produce after their kind And give the ultimate satisfaction And we use our imagination To send out vibration To bring us to our destiny That's why we're living The law of attraction, yeah Cause thoughts held in mind produce after their kind and give me the ultimate satisfaction. Yes, we are living the law of attraction, yeah. As I know thoughts held in mind produce after their kind, give me the ultimate satisfaction. Cause thoughts held in mind produce after the kind and give the ultimate satisfaction you know all this talk of creativity and and we say co-create so what do we mean we never act alone we are co-creating with spirit we are co-creating with others and we are co-creating playing in this field of infinite possibility. Quantum physicists call it the zero point field. And they also speak of it as a subatomic world of pure potentiality. Greg Braden calls it the divine matrix and Abraham through Esther Hicks calls it the vortex. She implores us to ask the question, what's in your vortex? It's really about how aligned are you with the divine and what it is that you desire and that you are wanting to bring forth. So we can ask ourselves questions like, how do I feel? Because it's that feeling nature that will give a sense of where we are in that vibrational scale. If we feel joyful, if we feel in the flow, those are keys that we're on the right track, so to speak. So what is it that you love to do that maybe mirrors that feeling for you? 
this helps me to recognize I love to swim. And so when I'm swimming, I feel like I'm really in the divine flow with the rhythmic strokes and the breathing. And especially when the sun filters in through the water, I feel like I'm in the flow of the divine and in, immersed in divine light. That feeling for me is very much a similar feeling to when things are clicking along in my life in a way that feels like I'm, I'm in that divine alignment. So maybe there's some activity for you that you do that gives you that sense of flow. Maybe you're working on art or music and you get lost in that, that, that creative flow. You know that feeling. And so you can, you can use that as a as sort of a, a sense of, yeah, what's that feeling that, am I having that feeling? Or maybe go do that activity to help you sort of spur on that, that feelings. So whatever that is that invokes the feeling for you, do more of that. So as we engage in the, the process now of co-creativity, we have something really working for us. We've got an extra boost of energy like none I've ever known in my lifetime because there is this collective spiritual awakening happening. There's a sense of innovation and creativity and possibility percolating. It feels like firing on all cylinders. And so we can, as we co-create now, we have all that energy sort of boosting us. Brenly just co-created a couple of things that she's been holding in mind and heart for some time. She got transferred from Union City, which was a very long commute in Kaiser, to Walnut Creek, which has been her desire for a long time. <laughs> I see Annie praising out of the corner of my eye. And she also had another thing that she was wanting to manifest that went along with this job transfer, which was an electric bike. And so she has now purchased an electric bike and it brings her so much joy. She's like a child with it. Um, and it's really fun to watch. So it's mostly fun to ride alongside her, except for when we get to those hills and she engages the pedal assist and she sails over the hill and I huff and puff on my old manual bike to try to catch up. And so it, but it, that energy boost is much like that. It's like, it's like we're all on an electric bike right now instead of a manual. And so it's that we get that boost to, to move forward in what it is that we are desiring, what it is that we are imagining for our world and for our individual lives and for the people around us that we care about. So imagine yourself just hopping aboard that, that electric bike and you don't even have to turn the pedal assist on because it's on, it's full blast <laughs> and you can just cruise it down, down the road toward what it is that we are creating. So whatever it is that is knocking on the door of your heart, I encourage you to open it up and see and see if you might not be willing. I'm not gonna say ready because a lot of times we don't feel ready, but willing to step in and to allow that to be manifested in your life, to call forth from that infinite, absolute, invisible realm into the visible material realm, that thing that only you can really manifest the way that you can. So if somebody else does it, it won't be the same thing because it is through your heart, through your mind, through your own co-creative and unique soul expression that that thing can come forth in a way that it can't benefit others in the same way. I hope that makes sense. So whatever it is, we can imagine it in its completeness and then think and feel it into its being. And then we all can benefit from it. Your best co-creative tools are right here, your heart and your mind. And so to use those, we become like the little engine that could. I think I can, and so I do. I feel I can, and so I do. Let's know this truth together as we practice co-creativity throughout the week and beyond. Together, I co-create through the desire of my heart and the power of my imagination. I think I can, so I do. Blessings.